All right. Okay, so from yesterday, um, sorry, from last Thursday, we covered, gave you an introduction to ARIMA models. And I just wanna give you a big picture view of ARIMA models. So this is an approach to fitting a time series model based on difference, first differencing the data to produce a new stationary time series. And it's a feature of differencing your data that you can just keep differencing and differencing and, and basically eventually you remove all the um, trends in the data. And you um, usually with enough differencing can uh, achieve a stationary time series. So you've transformed your data and created something stationary. So it has no trend, it doesn't go up or down, it doesn't have any loop-de-loops in it. It's kind of flat with fluctuations around it. And then you can fit a ARMA model to that transformed data. And this works because of something called the Wold decomposition, which says that any stationary time series can be modeled as an ARMA process. And uh, what we're doing in practice is we're approximating by an ARMA pra uh, process. You could fully model it if you had infinite number of lags, but we're not going to have infinite number of lags. We're going to have some finite uh, smaller number of lags. So that's the basic idea with, with this ARIMA approach. Okay, And on Thursday, we covered the basic um, procedure or method that you use to take the ARIMA approach. So the first step is you're going to do the differencing to get stationarity. And there's some a series of standard tests that you do to assess whether you have achieved, achieved stationarity. And once you've achieved stationarity, then you determine the uh, number of lags in the AR and the MA part of the model that you need to fit the data. Then you'll estimate the parameters and then you do your residuals diagnostics. So the ARIMA approach is just one approach that you could use for fitting non-stationary time series data. And in fact, it's not the approach that we're gonna be using in the most of the class. Um, and now if you look at any te um, textbook on classical time series analysis, the ARIMA approach is gonna factor in really big. It's uh, a long, long history. It's a very important uh, method. But you know, I was thinking about it as um, a subject editor um, for many years, and I, I have been a subject editor for many years in ecology journals. And so I, I review a lot of papers that use time series methods given my expertise. And I actually can't think of a paper that I have reviewed that used ARIMA models unless it was some type of model comparison. So they're comparing ARIMA to some other approach. And um, I, I don't know about Mark, uh, do you run into ARIMA models very often? It's pretty rare. Pretty rare, yeah. And um, so- I, I, I was gonna say, I, I've never gotten a paper either, uh, <laughs> but I just actually got one this, like in 10 years, I've never gotten a paper to review <laughs> until this morning. I got a paper that is, uh, forecasting rhino poaching, po rhino poaching using ARIMA mo models. <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, so, um, you know, in, um, in our field, it's, it's uh, ARIMA models are, are not actually that, that common. Um, instead, we tend to use other approaches for dealing with non-stationarity. And so um, other really common approaches would be, um, a regression model. So you're trying to, you're using some type of um, nonlinear function to model the, the sort of average level in your data. And then you have some autoregressive errors. You're gonna see that in, uh, or variants of that in um, later lectures. Um, 
Another really common approach is what are called stochastic level models. And you're going to be doing a lot of st stochastic level models. This is a, um, a type of hidden random walk. And this is very, very common in our field. And this is the bulk of, of what this class is going to be working on, is classes of models, the state-based models, where you have a hidden process and you are trying, and that uh, hidden process is some kind of trend often, not necessarily, but often, and you're trying to estimate that underlying process. Um, another class of, or another way that you um, might model a uh, non-stationarity in your data, so it's, you know, some kind of, so your data are not flat, just fluctuating about some flat level, but rather that level is changing through time. Another approach to that is something called an, an ARMA X model. So you still have the ARMA feature, which is uh, say, sorry, you still have the AR feature where the data at time T is a function of the data at T minus one or T minus two, whatever. Um, but then you include some covariates in that so that your error here is not um, mean zero uh, and it's not time constant. Rather, that mean of your error is changing because you have these covariates in there. We're going to be doing a lot of that too later on in the class. <clears throat> and then lastly, um, I didn't put it on here, but um, another approach is um, exponential smoothing models, which is another class of these hidden um, hidden random walk models. It's related to them. And we're gonna cover that um, later in the class. So the, these approaches are the common approaches in um, fisheries research management uh, when we're looking at time series data and how we deal with non-stationarity in the data. So let's see an example of that. Um, just so you know, you see what that might look like um, using some simulated data. So here's an example. So let's say I had an AR1 process and it's just gonna look like this. Um, I simulated it X at time T is 0.8 times X at time T minus one plus this, uh, I added white noise. Really simple AR1 process. And then I'm gonna make this trend, which is this red line here, which is, when I say trend, I just mean the, the overall mean of the, the, of the data. So, you know, think about, you know, whatever smooth line is going through this. So I'm gonna create this red line and I just uh, simulated a third order polynomial or I created a third order of polynomial. So that's that red line there. And then what we're observing, our data is um, that trend, the red line here, plus the AR. So it's basically some underlying trend and AR1. So how could we analyze that data? Well, we could do the ARIMA approach, which is if we, take this black line, that data, and we start differencing it, we're gonna create stationary data. And once it's stationary, we can then fit a ARMA model to that. So if you did auto ARIMA, just using the default values, then that's what it would do. So in this example, I've taken the first 90 time steps of those 100 time steps of data, going to pass that to auto ARIMA. What it's going to do, it's first going to find a difference that would get rid of that trend. And once it uh, has that difference, it's going to fit the difference data with a ARMA model. And it turns out in this example, the model that's selected is the following. And what is that? ARMA 0, 1, 0 is a random walk, so it's one difference and then no AR 
or no MA for the difference data. With drift means that it, it'll tend to go up or tend to go down. Okay, so that's how you do it if you wanted to fit a ARIMA model. And if you were to forecast from that, you could just uh, pass that fit into the forecast and it's gonna nicely forecast for you. You can see it has the drift. That, that means that this is going, uh, th this uh, blue line here is not zero. If there was no drift, it would just be a flat line. So, but it does have drift. It tends to go in this case upward. And then I plotted the actual 10 data points there. Okay, so that's one approach, but another approach I could use is to do a regression, linear regression on that trend and model the errors as autoregressive, which is in fact how I generated the data. So that model looks like this. So if I want to do a third order polynomial, I could do however many orders I wanted. Um, let's say, you know, I think that 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 wiggly line yeah, that could be um, sort of uh, reasonably third order polynomial. So this is what the equation for that regression would look like. So there's my intercept and then there's my third order polynomial and it's third order in the, the T axis there. And then I have my errors. And in this case, I want to fit a model where I don't say the errors are uh, white noise. They're not independent of time. I want to allow that they are autocorrelated. And you can fit that model with auto arima, but you have to pass in a few extra things. So if you poked around on the help file for auto arima, you will notice this thing called xreg. And that, those are covariates. And it's not 100% obvious, if, at least to me, when I read the help files, um, that what happens when you pass in xreg is that it does a linear regression on your covariates that you're passing into xreg. That's what's happening there. It's doing a linear regression, but you model the errors here as autocorrelated with a, a, using an, an ARMA process. All right, so let, let's just look at for this function. If I wanted to do that uh, regression, what that would look like, I need to pass in a column vector with my covariates. So I'm going to do this third order, order polynomial. So I'm going to C bend my time, time squared, time cubed. So that's gonna get my third order polynomial. Um, <laughs> I put a little note here. Um, I, I'm showing it like this for teaching purposes. If you were actually doing polynomial regression, you do not do that because you're entering covariates that are highly correlated with each other. And if you're doing regression, you don't want correlated covariates. Um, so in practice, that's not what you do. In practice, what you do is you use this poly function, which is going to give you your orthogonal um, uh, polynomials. Okay, that's an aside for teaching purposes. I'm just going to show it just like this. So I've got t, t squared, and t uh, cubed. So I'm going to pass that in to auto arima. I'm going to tell it, don't do any differencing because I don't want to do an arima model. I want to do a regression model, a third with a third order order polynomial, and I want those errors to be arma. So I need to tell it, don't even consider doing any differencing. So if I pass that in, what it does is you can see here, it gets an intercept. These are the betas up here that it's fitting. And then the autoregressive error, it's an AR1 is what the estimate is with about 0.76, which is very close to what I actually simulated it with. 
And if we forecast with this, you can see that it's quite different. Um, so uh, in, in this case, those uh, uh, the actual points uh, fall quite a bit closer to the expected values, which is the blue line there. But the really key thing to notice is that the confidence intervals here are quite a bit different. Okay, so there's, I think a natural thing to think about when you, you see this versus that is to ask, What's the right way to do that? What's the right answer? And um, sometimes there's kind of an obvious right answer, right answer. Um, but oftentimes with real data, like you don't know exactly how you should be modeling that data. And I, what I just want you to get from those two images is that how you think about your data will have consequences for your inferences about what's going to happen. So if you did an ARIMA model, you would um, uh, say you had a lot more uncertainty in your forecast. Whereas if you modeled uh, the data in this way using a uh, regression, third order polynomial with ARMA errors, you would say you were a lot more certain about your forecast. We're gonna see that theme once we get into state space models also. All right, so uh, switch gears a bit here and I wanna cover very briefly seasonal ARIMA models. So at least that you've seen these and you know, um, if you hear that term, you know basically what's going on. All right, so seasonal data within R. In the ATSA library, um, we have a data set called Chinook Month. It is monthly catch data from Washington and Oregon and has the year, the month, species, state. I, I'm just showing the top of this. So it's just showing Washington. If you looked at the bottom, you'll see there's also Oregon and it's got log metric tons and metric tons. Value was the um, uh, value of the catch in dollars. Within R, we can make this a time series object and then that object is going to have the seasonality information. So it's going to have the information that these are monthly data. And um, it'll, uh, we can pass in when the data start and um, it'll compute when they finish based on the length of the time series. So the data are still like just a series of numbers, but we've added a little information that can be used for plotting and that will also be used for uh, fitting functions that are fitting seasonal, um, seasonal models. So these fun fitting functions will look up this extra information about the seasonality. So it'll know, ah, okay, this is monthly data. Okay, I, I can deal with that. Um, so here's the, um, how you set this up. You're going to pass in your data. In this case, it's those log, I'm going to pass in the log metric tons, and I just want to use the Washington data. It starts in 1990 in January. So I pass in 1990, comma one, first month, January. If it started in February, I would put a two here. And then I need to say the frequency. This is monthly data, so it's uh, 12. Now, um, I should point out to, that you should be careful when you're setting up time series, um, seasonal time series, that you don't have any missing data. So you don't want to say, you know, if February were missing, you don't want to have this row missing. Instead, you want to have an NA there. 
<clears throat> so you do need to have data for every month and every year when you're setting this up. All right, so this is what these particular data look like. This is just Washington. You can see very strong seasonal cycle. This is Chinook data. Not surprising that it's very uh, cyclic like that. There happens to be a big gap um, when they had stopped the monitoring or collection of that data. All right, so if we were to take a seasonal ARIMA approach, what do we do? Well, these are uh, seasonal data and it has a very strong seasonal cycle. So these data have a trend, okay? Um, it's not, not just a seasonal trend, but also it, it's got this kind of uh, downward trend like that. And we need to get rid of that. We need to get rid of that seasonal trend. And we also need to get rid of this uh, sort of average trend in the data. So to get rid of that seasonal trend, we do a seasonal difference. So what that means is you're going to take the data at time t and you're going to subtract the data from, um, in this case, it's annual. So you would uh, subtract the data from 10 months prior. If it was quarterly, you would subtract um, T minus uh, four. So you would subtract off four quarters prior. So what is this in terms of annual data? So this would be, let's say that this is T is 1990. This difference would be January, 1990 minus January, 1989. February, 1990 minus February, 1989. It's those differences. And it's those differences that we're going to model with a ARMA model. So if we did this seasonal difference to the Chinook data, this is what it looks like. And you can see it pretty much gets rid of that seasonal cycle. Yay, that's what we want. And it also is getting rid of that downward trend which is not surprising because we know that differences will get rid of a linear trend. So it's getting rid of two things that we need to get rid of, the seasonal cycle and the linear trend. In R, the way that you will do a seasonal difference is you pass in this lag. So in here, I pass in lag equals 12. <clears throat> If it were quarterly data, the frequency would be four. And so I would say lag equals four. Okay, so here's the structure of a um, seasonal ARIMA model called SARIMA. So we have the I in here, so we've got differencing that's gonna um, produce stationarity. That's a property whenever you have this I in there, that's what's going on there. And then we have SARMA. So we have AR and MA parts with a seasonal and a non-seasonal component. The basic structure of that is we have, um, so let's just start with the AR part of this. We're gonna have an AR part that is non-seasonal and an AR part that is seasonal. This is specific to these um, SARIMA uh, models. Okay, so here, there's my difference. So the data that I'm gonna model and I'm going to have a part where I have ZT is a function of ZT minus one. That's called the non-seasonal part. And then I have a part where I have ZT is a function of the value 12 months prior. Again, 12 months, because it's annual. If it were quarterly, it would be four months prior. So this is 
the non what's called the non seasonal part. And this is the seasonal part. Okay, so let's just sort of think about what what's going on there. So if my um, if my ZT is one seasonal difference, so I've figured out that all I need to do to make my data look, you know, fairly stationary is to do a seasonal difference. So I've got, and now I've decided I'm going to be modeling January, um, say January 1990 minus January 1989, you know, et cetera. So that's when I'm going to be modeling those 12 month lag differences. So, and, and then I'm gonna model, let's say I'm gonna model it with something that looks like this. I'll, I'll get into this part in a moment. Let's just focus on this part. So what it's saying is that these January differences are correlated with the February difference. Oh, sorry, it, it, it would be the February differences are correlated with the January differences. The January differences are correlated with the December differences. So that's saying that, okay, if, um, if uh, February this year was really much larger than February last year, then it's more likely that uh, the January, let me start over. I keep getting my order mixed up here. So if the February this year was much larger than February last year, then the next month, my Marches would be more likely to be much larger than the March last year. So that's what that quote unquote non-seasonal part would be saying. And then this part, the seasonal part is saying, okay, if the February's, if the February this year is much larger than the February last year, then the next year, it's also likely to be much larger. So there's this uh, multi, there's a correlation across uh, the whole year is this part. And this one is saying there's correlation from month to month. It's correlation from year to year, correlation from month to month. The notation for these seasonal ARIMA models looks like this. This is the non-seasonal part. This is the seasonal part. And this is the frequency. So let's go back here. So that first part in parentheses, it's talking about this part of the model. The second part of the parentheses, it's talking about this part of the model. Now, I said I'd uh, mentioned uh, about this part here. These are these cross products that appear when you have uh, both of these in um, in the model. And it's not really obvious why this would come up um, in the way that I've written this model. But if I had written this in the backshift formation um, formulation that Mark talked about uh, last week, then it's really obvious why this falls out. You don't really, for the purpose of understanding um, Sarima models, you don't really need to think about this. You should think about what's going on here. Okay, let's see some examples. So if you saw this ARIMA model, let's walk through how you figure out what on earth is going on. So step one, when you tackle an ARIMA model is to figure out what it is you're modeling. So to do that, you're going to look at the differencing. So this is to figure out what that Z is. The Z is what's going to be modeled by the AR uh, plus MA part. So let's look at the differences. We don't have any lag one differences. 
we only have a lag 12 difference. Remember, this is lag one, this is lag 12, non-seasonal, seasonal. So we've got one difference here. So what that means is that what we are modeling is the seasonal difference. So in our um, example, we are modeling January this year minus January last year, February this year minus February last year, et cetera. Okay, so that's what that says. Now we've figured out what we're modeling. Next, we not need to figure out what our AR part looks like. Okay, we're not gonna care about the error yet. We're just gonna think about the AR part. So let's see, what do we got here? Here's our AR part here. So we've got an AR part lag one and we've got one AR in the seasonal lag. And so we've got this, there we go. And we have that, great. And then we have some cross products. I'm not gonna care about those. Third step, we're gonna think about what does the error look like? So what does that W look like? And to get that W, what the error looks like, we then look at the moving average part. In this case, both of these are zero. That means we have no moving average. So that means that we're just modeling the error as white noise. Okay. Any, if you're getting lost, just throw out a question and I'll go over it again. Okay. Let's see another one. This is a um, uh, Serima model that's called a seasonal random walk model. And it looks like this. So let's first figure out what are we modeling? Okay, so we'll start off with the D, the differencing. No lag one difference. We have only a one here. So that means we're doing Again, a seasonal difference with drift means we have a mean there. That means the data are not mean zero. They have a mean different than zero. Now let's figure out what the Z model is. Well, we don't have any AR lag one and we don't have any AR um, lag uh, 12 uh, either. So it's basically, we're just saying that seasonal difference with mean is equal to our noise, our error. What does our error look like? So that's step three. Now we look at the MA, zero, zero. So that means that our error here is just white noise. What does this uh, model mean in just kind of lay terms, what it would mean is that your expected value for um, January in 1990 is just whatever the value was the prior year. So January 1989 plus some constant mean. That's it. That is what a seasonal random walk model is. Let's see another one. Um, this is called the airline model, really common um, model of this class. Let's step through figuring out what we're modeling. Okay, so again, we're gonna start with the Ds. What do we have here? We have one lag one model uh, difference and one seasonal difference. It doesn't matter what order you do these in. So let's do the seasonal part first. So we're going to have the seasonal difference this year minus the seasonal difference last year. That's what we're modeling, that's our Z. Now let's look at the AR part, zero, zero. So there is no AR part, it just means that those differences up here is being modeled as our error term. So what that's saying is the Z at time T is not a function of Z at time T minus one, nor is it a function at Z at time T minus 12. 
Step three, we ask, what does the moving average part look like? Uh, sorry, what does the error look like? Is it white noise or is it something different? Is it moving average? Is it autocorrelated noise? It's autocorrelated noise because we have the MA terms. And what does it look like? Well, we have uh, a lag one moving average bit and we have a seasonal moving average bit. And you add them just like you normally would. So you've got our white noise and then our lag one there, and then we'll have our seasonal bit there. And then we have these uh, cross terms. So let's go through and um, run this um, or fit this model to our Chinook data. Hey, Eli. Yeah. Um, could you go back um, one second? I'm a little confused. <laughs> um, so what would the full model look like? I'm just, because uh, there's the, you have like the ZAT and then ZAT again. I'm a little, I'm a little confused <laughs> on what, okay. um, yeah, the full model is. Right, so the full model would um, have two equations to it. First, okay. you want to write down what you're modeling. So in this case, my ZT that I'm modeling with this ARMA equation is these differences here. So there's a seasonal difference and a lag one difference. So that's what I'm modeling. And then my equation is just ZT equals this. So ZT equals that right there. And e, ET is white noise. Mm -hmm. So if, um, if this was written in a paper or something like that, you would just have those two like right underneath each other. Uh, that's sort of what it would look like. Yes, correct. Okay. You, you wouldn't like have this, um, this intermediary step. You would just go, this equals that. Okay, gotcha, thanks. Right, although uh, I think that if I saw this in a paper, uh, probably someone would just write this form. And when I look at these models, say if I were like reading a paper again, rather than focusing on the particulars of the equation, at least for my first pass when I'm reading the, the paper, I'm basically, you know, I'm focused, uh, um, you know, here, okay, you know, right, aha, uh -huh, that's what they're modeling. And then I'm gonna, you know, glance at the AR part. And so I wanna know, um, are these differences, are they themselves autocorrelated? So let's say I, I just had a seasonal difference. So I wanna know, oh, okay, is the uh, January differences, are they correlated with the February? Ah, keep doing that order wrong. Are the January differences correlated with the December differences? Are the February differences correlated with the January differences? If that were true, then I'm going to have auto regression here. And um, another question would be, okay, well, are the uh, January differences this year correlated with the January differences last year? And if that were the case, I'd have a, a value there. So in this case, there's none of that autocorrelation going on. The only thing that's happening is that my um, errors are autocorrelated themselves. Does that make more sense? I hope, okay. So again, the auto ARIMA function and the forecast package will fit these models for you very quickly. It's really nice. Here's an example. I'm going to take the Chinook data and I'm going to just look at 1992, 2000. Remember, it's got that really big gap in it where there's no data. I'm, um, uh, the, the model will fit just fine if I um, uh, fit to all the data. It's, it doesn't have any problems with missing values. Um, but it's just going to look a little uh, nicer without this big uh, gap in it. 
So I'm gonna just cut that off just so it looks a little cleaner. So I use the window function to take a time series and um, get a window of that. So I'm telling it start with 1990 January and end in 2000 December. So that's what I'm going to uh, model. And if I just pass that into auto arima, so I just use the default behavior, it is going to um, it's going to detect that this is seasonal data and it will fit a seasonal model. You can tell it not to do this, but this will be the default is that it will try a seasonal model on seasonal data. Okay, so if I do that with the Chinook data, this is the model that it fits right here. So let's see here. Yeah, okay. So that's the model that it fits. Let's break that down and figure out what that model is. So there it is at the top. So what is being modeled? Look at the Ds. We only have a seasonal difference. So it's just modeling our seasonal differences. January this year minus January last year, February this year minus February last year. That's what we're modeling. With drift, means that those differences are not mean zero. Next, let's look at the AR part. And we do have now a value in the AR column, the AR place, not here in the seasonal part, but over here. So it's saying that the um, this month's seasonal difference, so say the January seasonal difference, uh, difference is correlated with the previous month, so the December's seasonal difference. But the January difference this year is not correlated with the January difference last year. It's just a, a one month correlation. And then lastly, we do have um, some MA in there. So our errors do have some autocorrelation. It's fairly long. It's an annual autocorrelation. All right. And then the forecast package will let us easily do a forecast with that seasonal model. So. Just like that, we pass the fit in, we tell it how many time steps forward, and then we can plot it and it shows it. All right. So summary, if you wanna fit these types of models, the uh, key uh, steps for you is to get your data into a time series object with the frequency specified. Make sure you don't have any missing data, any missing months or quarters, whatever your frequency is. Plot your data, look for any major issues. Then the next steps are, uh, next two steps will, sorry, um, the third step here will be done presumably by whatever function you're using to fit the data. Um, it's gonna do some differencing to remove the season and the trend. And then um, this next step fitting the model, if you use auto arima, again, it's going to do this for you. It'll walk through it. And you have a few different options of whether you want to do a step search algorithm or if you want to do a, um, a, uh, a comprehensive search. So basically looking at all possible uh, models up to a certain uh, lag level. And then you'll do your standard residual checks. Again, if you're using the forecast package, you're gonna use that function uh, check residuals and that's gonna do your standard residual checks for you. Okay. So that's your quick introduction to seasonal ARIMA models. Any questions on that? Okay, so just like with um, 
as I was talking about how ARIMA models is just one approach that you might use to deal with um, non-stationarity in your data. A seasonal ARIMA model is just one approach that you could use to deal with seasonality. And it's not the approach that we'll be using for the rest of the class. We'll be um, including some kind of uh, cycle to account for the seasonality. So that means we're going to be including a covariate, a seasonal covariate to account for that up and down behavior. Okay, so let me...